oh wow, I need to hold this too. Uh, Lo-Fi Uploads, I know it says mouse models. Lo-Fi Uploads is the name of our project. Um, you could also say it's whole brain simulation, not whole brain emulation. What if I was to tell you that we could upload, ah, damn it. Upload without actually understanding neuroscience. So that is like, I could say the ambitious sub, sub goal here. Uh, it, it, if you look at like the history of progress in machine learning, a decade ago we had entire community of researchers who had careers in handcrafting particular visual features like SIFT. We had other researchers working on the logic of Go engines. We have even more recently entire community of researchers working on the pipelines or natural language processing. And all of this has been replaced with machine learning. So why not, why not leverage the recent advances in narrow AI machine learning and scale that up to accelerate uploading? And the goal here is to reduce the scope of the problem by assuming that there is a sufficient NN model that can capture intelligence to the degree that we want. And our objective then only becomes to learn the architectural prior and the wiring constraints of that model. So, oh, whoops. Let's go like that. Where did I go? Okay. I tried and actually jumped. All right. <clears throat> All right. So the basic idea is that we somewhat ambitiously start with a mouse. But with a mouse, they only live three years. And we can capture, it's relatively straightforward to capture the lifetime experience of a mouse and all the video data, audio data, maybe even odor, you know, odor data if we wanted to. But let's start with the vision. So we have this visual uh, capture of their entire life. We put them through different laboratory tests we, to test uh, what they've learned, uh, all the kinds of standard experiments you might want to do. We capture all of that data. And then we use that to infer the structure of an ANN by inverting through a differentiable, uh, differentiable generative model that includes sophisticated rendering, the physics that you need, the articulation, the mouse body, the collision structure, uh, basically a complete um, computer simulation of the mouse environment, the mouse body, and the mouse's mind as an ANN. And once we solve that problem completely, then we have a, a, a gold standard of an ANN, of a mouse brain, and we've learned everything we need to know about what kind of ANN can functionally equivalently simulate a mouse mind. And then we can you start using that as our standard to learn uh, a different model, another vision model that essentially would invert project one's approach of making a generative model that goes from an ANN to the detailed rendering of a connectome scan. And we could, we could go from a connectome scan to infer and learn the structure of the NN wiring. So that is the general idea. Um, there's a lot of also interesting um, sort of like improvements or efficiency upgrades you could do here. So like if you take all the scanning data and you consider that to be something like old school magnetic tapes that you have mechanical, um, you have a way of actually like mechanically scanning on demand using active inference. So we can use techniques to discover where we have uncertainty currently in the NN model and then only actually look at and scan selectively the high resolution scan data in those areas where we currently are most uncertain. So there's a lot of ways we can use, use this, leverage this to greatly reduce the volume of the scanning data that one would need and treating it more as like a long-term storage or memory that is queried on demand. Just lost that for a second. Uh, all right, so, oh, how's it done today? So there is some precursor work that is somewhat related. There's an interesting paper by DeepMind uh, that I think we have a link to Gorin's site which has a reference to related stuff. Go deep neuroethology of a virtual rodent and they're not, they're not learning the, the structure from a vision model, but they do have a very detailed, neurophysically realistic simulation of a mouse body, their articulated skeleton, all that kind of stuff. And they put it in a virtual environment and they run it through a bunch of different tests and they're learning an ANN model of a mouse brain uh, purely through reinforcement learning techniques, which of course we could also supplement with this. You know, why would you only use one modality? But we could use reinforcement learning combined with obviously all the vision data as more constraints. And so this would be sort of a improvement in that same line of work. And what is doing your approach? We're taking a far less neurocentric approach than others and leveraging rapid advances in deep learning. Success, what does success look like? Success in this model would be, we have a mouse that we've done a number of experiments on and we've trained this mouse to perform certain tasks in our virtual environment, no, sorry, in our physical environment, our laboratory. And then we have the virtual twin of that mouse in the virtual laboratory that re replicates it. 
And after that training process and inference process is complete, we can test the two on the same tests and, and see whether the behavior replicates. And if we can functionally beh behaviorally replicate the virtual twin to its, its pair physical mouse, then we, we do that enough times that we, we have uh, functional equivalence. Hold on a second. So after achieving that functional equivalence, you can imagine then leveraging this up, scaling this up to larger animals, and you're learning a model. I somewhat expect that there's not a huge number of differences in this structure, the low-level connectome morphology and structure and neurology, that once you start to learn that across different mammal brains and scaling it up, then you can then learn, use that trained model to start uploading humans without having to do the full, um, without having 30 years of intensive video data for the human. Although, of course, that would also help. All right. And there's obvious, there's obvious contributions to AI safety because once you have these animals in here and you can start doing experiments, you can learn uh, how rodents uh, have empathy arises and what parts of the rodent brain, how it works, uh, how you know, bonding, pair bonding, everything works. And how does this contribute to the whole brain? Well, this would lead to, this is a, this is a pragmatic approach to whole brain simulation that sidesteps most of the really challenging problems in neuroscience and leverages, fully leverages machine learning along the way. So that's, that's, that's why this could be a shortcut. All right, how much will the project cost? Uh, you can sort of estimate that training large scale foundation models cost tens of millions. So it's not a super cheap project, but it has sort of reasonably known costs in terms of other projects that have done somewhat similar things. So it's, it's, it looks more like standard machine learning progress. And as far as what are your next steps if awarded a uh, thousand, two thousand, I don't know, we maybe have a dinner party or something, I'm not really sure you do a thousand dollars. Okay. <laughs> All right, awesome. questions? <laughs> you are first. So I wonder if you would agree that a less complicated version of this um, would be to download a random Let's Play on YouTube of any video game. And a random what play? A oh. random Let's Play where someone plays a video game that okay. explores the world and interacts with it for you know, 10, 20 you know, hours or so, uh, and then be able to essentially uh, emulate that video game. Do you think that's harder or easier than this project? Emulate the video game or emulate yes. the person playing the game? The video game. <coughs> I mean, it depends on the complexity of the video game. I don't, I'm not really familiar with Let's Play, so I don't know what video game you're talking about, but it would depend. Be, let's be like super concrete and we'll say Pokemon Yellow is like 1.8 megabytes. And I'm not really, so let me take a simple example. Sure. Take Quake, for example. Quake, great example. Let's All right. make it Quake 2, that's more fun. Right, Quake 2. <laughs> so, when, so learning Quake 2. I would say that's doable. You have many examples like at Game Gun yeah. or Muzuru, where you can learn deep models of the environment very well. But unfortunately, I feel like that uh, ignores most of the actual challenges because you have no particular reason to think that a video game which was written by humans for humans using a symbolic programming language in many ways to simplify uh, and, and generalize so would necessarily easier. recover the same kind of difficulty that you have of a, a trying to do like a brain. Do you think a video game is easier? I think a video game, yes, is generally going to be a lot easier. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, uh, no, I, think, I think learning Quake 2 would, be very, would be not be very difficult at all would not be difficult at all. Okay, Learning so Quake 2, not difficult at all. So meaning like if you play, if you watch someone do a Let's Play Quake 2, you would expect that you could then have a neural network version of Quake 2 where you can run through, get the various guns, shoot the enemies, and the HUD and everything will work. I don't know about Let's Play because I'm not familiar with it, but like if you give me a sufficient data set of, of videos of the game and the gameplay, Yes, they can use machine learning to learn Quake 2. And that yes. would essentially infer the hidden program state of, of the game engine. Yeah. Like I mean, it works, it works very well. Even things like, you know, Biz, Biz Doom, you can do model-based RL very well on those. And because the game themselves are not intrinsically all that complicated, and you, know, you can get very simple neural networks emulating them pretty well, enough to, you know, plan and learn inside of. But what happens when the less play didn't go into a secret area? You need coverage. So they didn't go into a particular... If you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't like, if you don't have any uh, frames of that, a section of the environment, that's not gonna, you're not gonna automatically learn that unless there's some generalization where you're, where that environment has 
some repetition or symmetry that it can be inferred through. I'm actually really curious what it would do because it's not gonna just jump into space like a poorly programmed model, but it will generate something. And maybe that's reasonable. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I would say that if you can't do it for a video game from a let's play, you definitely can't do it on I, I think it might be a confusion now. Like we're not really suggesting to learn from a single rap. You know, like a, a single rap would be like analogous to a single let's play video, right? I thought so, this was one rap video. The whole you you would try to, at the end, you would try to like do a specific uh, like rap. But you would pre-train on however many rats you... Yeah. you know, How many rats are we talking about? I thought this was just one. No, no, no. I'm saying that... Uh, no, no, no. I mean, to be determined exactly how many rats you need, but I've given an example that three years of data is equivalent to the trained data set of stable diffusion, which has learned a pretty reasonable generative image model of images without necessarily learning like model oh, physics. Since it's like a video of a laboratory also. Okay, so maybe as much. Yeah. All right, another question. I, if I heard you correctly, um, and you said something like you, one of the things you can gain from it is you can learn, for example, where maybe empathy comes from by finding out in the A and N what's generating them because you don't have access to the A and N. That would require and, um, multiple rodent simulations. Right, right, but I'm wondering, so because this is still an A and N that has been trained basically on the black box approach where you're producing the I.O., how can you then infer from that A and N, or know that when you're inferring from the A and N, that you're really getting how that actually emerges in, say, the rat brain or human brain? I don't know if rats have empathy in that sense. But. You're not. You're not necessarily getting. That's that's the thing. You're not going to get. It's going to work differently in the GPU A and N, but you're looking for something functionally equivalent. So you're. So it will find. If it succeeds, it will infer a functionally equivalent structure. Yeah. Something that might work very differently, similar, but it produces yeah, similar. At least empathy that is similar on the basis of the observed behavior. Yes. Yeah. It's a behaviorist. Like, it's essentially a behaviorist model. And like, I, I guess, I don't know, my, my concern or my objection to this would be like the classic cognitive science thing of like, you know, behaviorism didn't, didn't work, wasn't predictive. There are all these mouse studies, in fact, like Tolman's study, uh, that made us reject behaviorism and move to cognitivism. But like, actually, the GPT series of models kind of, uh, like denies that argument fairly effectively, and, and, and so I, I think the, the behavior is like. So, so okay, wait, 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 one more. The, the, in order to be really useful, you want to run now this neural network and say, do I get the counterpart of a hippocampus? Do I get the counterpart of a Lucas Aurelius or a pleasure center? It, it seems like in order to be really valuable, you need to kind of be able to look into it and examine if you get similar structures. If you do that. And the, even if it, you don't get it for all the parts of an actual brain, you still have learned something interesting. You might be that you get blocking of certain structures, which tells us that we can actually learn them without necessarily doing it super advanced scan. I would be surprised if you got blocking from the association cortex even in your right. I, I definitely would, since we're not simulating the entire development of the mouse's brain, I definitely would start with a high level modular architecture that looks very much like a brain, might even use spiking neural networks. It, it, we, it, it should be determined exactly like what level of detail you need to replicate, but it seems pretty clear it's like way above Hudgy, Hudley Hoxkin, and it's like yeah. probably, yeah, not even, maybe even neurotransmitter yeah, based. I was even maybe misunderstanding, I think that you were actually just doing the images of what the rat were doing, basically just doing video of a rat rather than the rat itself. And already that, for novel situations, might actually tell you that the network has learned relevant things about the internals of a rat. Wait, is it not video of a rat? It, um, the, the training data yeah. would be video of a rat, yes, but the model, the model includes like a physics simulation and it has a slot for an ANN which would be brain modular in its architecture. So I've watched multiple rats grow up from pups to they die because they're too old and they have pretty different personalities as they get older and like it's a moving target so I, like what is even, what would you expect a model to, to act like, like a three-year-old rat or a one-year-old rat? Yes. <laughs> like the very uh, they like they grow, they change. Like, Depends on the age of the virtual rat. Yeah. Huh. Okay, we'll leave it at this. Um, thank you very much, Jake.